Hello everyone, I hope everybody is doing okay. Today we will be doing chapter 34 in the book of Egan Fundamental of Respiratory Care. Chapter 34 is about neonatal and pediatric respiratory disorders. As a respiratory therapist, you need to know this. And let's get started. First, let's go over the chapter objectives. This, the first sentence is, after reading this chapter, you'll be able to discuss clinical findings, radiographic abnormalities in treatment of patients with respiratory distress syndrome. So you're gonna discuss the clinical findings, what are you gonna find when you look at the patient, when you look at your pediatric patient, and also when you look at your neonatal. Secondly, we're gonna define radiographic abnormalities. We're gonna look at radiographic abnormalities. We're gonna look at x-rays, such as this right here that we can see. And we're gonna look at a normal x-ray and uh, not a normal x-ray, an abnormal x-ray. Treatment of patients with respiratory distress syndrome. Also, we're gonna look at the treatments of patients with respiratory distress syndrome. Second bullet, it described the clinical manifestations in treatment of patients with transient tachypnea of the newborn. Described the path pathophysiology presentation in treatment of meconium aspiration syndrome. Identify the clinical signs and symptoms. We're gonna look at signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms associated with bronchial pulmonary dysplasia and the approaches used to manage these infants and how can we manage those infants. State the cause of treatment of apnea of prematurity. Describe the pathophysiology, diagnosis, treatment of persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Hypertension. When you look at hypertension, this is what I always remember. I remember, um, what is it? Uh, is a word that I'm looking for. Nitric, nitric oxide. When you look at pediatric and pulmonary hypertension, always remember nitric oxide, because that's what's, what they use most of the time is nitric oxide to treat pulmonary hypertension. <laughs> Discuss the pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment of conditional diaphragmatic hernia. Identify the anatomic defects associated with Trutrology of folate, fo, fo, folate. Describe the clinical presentation of ventricular septal defect. Describe types and associated conditions for abnormal wall defects. Define epidemiology effects associated with increased risk for sudden infant death syndrome. Identify the respiratory problems associated with gastrophageal reflux disease. State the clinical findings commonly observed in patients with bronchiectasis. Describe the clinical features and treatment of children with epiglitis. Epiglitis. Describe clinical manifestations in treatment of cystic fibrosis. There's a lot to cover here in this chapter, and you need to learn a lot here. Okay, chapter outline. Neonatal, neonatal respiratory disorders, lung parenchymal disease, control of breathing, pulmonary vascular disease, congestional abnormalities affecting respiration, congestional heart disease, hypertension of the newborn. So we're gonna go uh, by the outline and those are the terms that you should be familiar with and you will see these terms in the chapter. So let's get started with the first page. And I have my paper and pen to take some notes. And let's get started. Many perineal disorders affect respiratory system. Some disorders are developmental abnormalities of the heart, lungs, or airways. Some are caused by prematurity. Some are caused by problems during labor and delivery. And some are caused by treatments. Common disorders in the neonatal peri period with which respiratory therapists RT should be familiar are respiratory di distress syndrome, transient trachypnea of the newborn 
hypoconium, aspiration syndrome, apnea, prematurity, bronchial pulmonary dysplea, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, and conditional cardiopulmonary abnormalities. So every sentence, every word is important. So let's start over again. Many prenatal disorders affect the respiratory system. So many prenatal disorders, they affect your respiratory system, okay? Some disorders, so we have some disorders are developmental abnormalities, prematurity. So some of those disorders are because the infant is premature. And uh, of the heart, no, developmental abnormalities of the heart, some, some of them of the heart, lungs, airways are some caused by prematurity, some are caused by problems during labor. So some of them are caused by premature that the, pa the baby or the infant came out too fast or during labor and delivery. Some are caused by treatments and some of them are caused by treatments. What they mean here is like when the mothers were taking any type of medication that can cause uh, defects on the baby, the newborn. So pregnant women should be very careful about medications that they take while during their pregnancy because that will, will uh, some of the medication have bad side effects that can affect the infant. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Neonatal respiratory disorder, lung parenchymal disease, respiratory distress syndrome. So we're gonna start with the first one. Number one, respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS. R D S, not A, RDS. Forgive me for that. RDS, okay? So background, neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, A, I mean RDS, affects approximately 40,000 infants each year in the United States. So ARDS, I mean RDS, why do I keep saying A? RDS, affects 40 infants each year in the United States. So if we look at how many infants are born in the United States, each year, so approximately 40,000 of those infants are affected by this RDS. So I'm gonna Google to see how many, each year, how many infants are born in the US, so we can know the number. About how many infants born in a year, in the USA. Okay, so last year there were about 3.6 million, 3.6 million newborns. So out of those 3.6 million, we have 40,000 were born with this RDS, with respiratory distress syndrome. That's a big number if you look at it. Out of 3.6 million, 40,000 in a year. Okay, so this is what we get. Although the death rate has decreased dramatically over the past four decades, many infants still die or have chronic effects of syndrome, of the syndrome. RDS, also known as high line membrane disease. So another name for it, another name, name is also called high line membrane disease so it's still the same thing just a different name okay is a disease 
okay also known as hyaline membrane is a disease of prematurity so this this disease is known as a, a disease of prematurity that means the babies are not mature so we're gonna put a fact here known of prematurity where did I see that okay name okay now let's continue oh name of pre maturity okay that means this this disease is for babies who are born premature and when we say premature means infants who have not reached uh, women that did not go through the full term of pregnancy means the baby was born before uh, the weeks of 37 The incidence increases with decreased gestational age. This sentence. The incidence increases with decreasing gestational age. That means if babies are born, so new newborns, uh, complete pregnancy is 37 weeks. Correct? Weeks. So the less weeks, the higher, the, the less weeks, less than 37 the lesser weeks the higher the um increase with decreased gestational age that means the higher risk the baby will have a, a, a rds what i'm trying to say is let's say that your baby was born 26 weeks there's a higher chance he might develop um rds than uh, an infant who is born 32 weeks so this is an example here example is that a uh, 26 week baby will have a higher risk of developing rds than a 32 weeks infant okay so this is what this sentence is is saying here the major factors in the pathophysiology of rds are qualitative surfactant deficiency decreasing alveolar surface area increasing small airways increased small airways airways compliance and presence of ductus arteriosus so the cause the major factor the passive very qualitative surfactant. okay so the main cause cause of RDS, the main cause of RDS is, because this is right here in this sentence, the major factors in pathophysiology of RDS are quantitative surfactant deficiency, so qualitative surfactant, so the main cause is, I'm going to put one here, number one is, surfactant deficiency surfactant deficiency we all know that the alveoli has surfactant in it which is lower surface tension that means to keep the airways to keep the alveoli open so with these new infants, they have less uh, surfactant. Deficiency means less. Okay. So now if we go to uh, decrease alve... Okay. This is the second. Decreased alveolar, decreased alveolar surface area. So we, when you have uh, uh, the surfactant deficiency, the cause of that will cause... Um, a decreased I'm gonna just gonna put an arrow instead of writing the whole word decreased you're gonna have when you have surfactant deficiency the cause the the, the um, outcome of surfactant deficiency so you're gonna have less surface area which is what I'm talking about less surface area in the alveoli okay Deficiency of just increased small airways compliant increased small airways 
compliance in presence of ductus arterius. So the airways are smaller as well, okay? So what we know so far about ARDS is that is also called hyaline membrane disease and it's known of prematurity and we also know that this happens the younger the baby the higher risk of developing RDS and we also know the main cause of ARDS is surfactant deficiency and surfactant deficiency when you have no more surfactant the surfactant is what helped to decrease surface tension in the alveoli which keeps when you have a less surface tension in the alveoli, it keeps the alveoli open. So when you have surfactant deficient, there's no more, there's no surface area. And we have, when we have less surface area, that means no more gas exchange. Okay, and then that results in lower oxygen saturation or hypoxemia. Okay, let's continue here. Rule of thumb. The incidence of RDS increase with decreased gas station. This is exactly what I was just saying here. This is the example that I gave. This example here. And they're saying it here. The incidence of RDS increase with decreasing gestational age. That means the lower the age of the baby, that the, the earlier the baby comes out, like a 20 week or a 26 week or a 30 week is there's a, a higher chance of them, of the infant developing RDS. Cool. Now let's continue. Surfactant production depends on both the relative maturity of the lung and the adequacy of the fetal perfusion. Maternal factors that impair fetal blood flow such as abrupt placenta and the maternal diabetes also, by, also, also may lead to RDS. Okay, here's another thing that can lead to RDS. Maternal factors that impair fetal blood flow, such as abruption placenta and maternal diabetes also may lead to RDS. So when the patient, the, the mother of the patient has uh, maternal diabetes, this also may lead to ARDS of the patient because there will be no blood flow, sufficient blood flow to, to the placenta. And remember, we know that where the gas exchange happen when, when the baby is in, their, in, in the mother's stomach, the gas exchange when we are alive right now, gas exchange happen in the lung, right? But the baby gas exchange doesn't happen in the lung because his lung is filled with fluid and there, it's impossible for gas exchange. So gas exchange happens where by the placenta. That's why the baby have the umbilical cord. So if there's impaired fetal blood flow to that placenta, there will be abruption placenta and maternal diabetes. And if the mother has a maternal diabetes, some women develop diabetes during when they're pregnant. So when those two factor occurs, so this may also lead the, to the baby to have RDS. So we can put here another, um, we can add here another po point cause of, of, of um, RDS is we can put here uh, impaired, impaired, impaired fetal blood flow and the second one is maternal diabetes and that's when i said the mother couldn't develop diabetes during their pregnancy and that can also have the baby develop um rds okay so that's added okay now let's continue okay pathophysiology in pre preterm infants. Now we're going to talk about the pathophysiology. Adequate amounts of surfactant are present in the lung. Okay, so they have adequate amount of surfactant are present in the lung. However, the surfactant is trapped inside two cells. So type 2 cells that have the surfactant. Infants with RDS type 2 cells do not release adequate amount of surfactant. The surfactant that is released in incomplete form, so it does not make tubular myelin 
and does not decrease alveolar surface tension because the surfactant molecule in the alveolus is structurally abnormal. The type 2 cells and alveolar macrophages have more rapid uptake for recycling. Thus, there is an qualitative deficiency of alveolar surfactant. So here, they're talking about why the surfactant. There is surfactant, but why it's not, it's deficient because of type 2 cells. So now, if we go here and read and try to understand is, so I can write a question here, which, I can make up a question, which cell produce surfactant. And the answer is type two cells in the lung because you have type one and type two. So type two is what produces surfactant. Okay. So let's read this again so we can understand. In infants with RDS, type two cells do not release adequate amount of surfactant. So there are two types, two cells right now. We have two types type 2 cells and this is what produces the surfactant so in infants they, they have it but it doesn't produce enough to uh, to create that surface tension which is keeps the alveoli open the surfactant that is released is incompletely formed so it's not it's not completely formed so it does not make tubular myelin and does not decrease alveolar surface tension because the surfactant molecules in the alveolus is structurally abnormal, type the type 2 cells in alveolar macrophages have more rapid uptake for recycling. Thus, there is an adequate sufficient of alveolar surfactant. Okay, now we understand here. The problem is that type 2 cell is producing it, but is not, at, is not completely formed. So, because the baby is, is not fully developed, and that makes sense. Okay. Now, let's go. Figure 34 to 1 outlines the pathophysiologic events associated with ARDS. A qualitative decrease in surfactant increases alveolar surface tension forces, which causes alveoli to become unstable and collapse and leads to atelectasis, an increased work of breathing. At the same time, the increased surface tension draws fluid from the pulmonary capillaries into alveoli. In combination, these factors impair oxygenation change and cause severe hypoxemia a severe hypoxemia and acidosis okay now let's look at figure 31 34 to um to one okay so we have decreased surfactant which increased increased surface tension right after surface tension we have atelectasis from atelectasis ventilation perfusion mismatch increased work of breathing and hypercapnia which leads to acidosis then increased pulmonary vascular resistance then right to left shunt okay how hypoxemia pathology of respiratory distress and fluid leakage hyaline membrane formation Okay. It's confusing. This graph, I didn't like it because it's confused. It's not confusing. It, it just needs, if you don't understand it, it's going to be very confusing for you. So I prefer to just try to understand it first. Then we, we will come back to it. So now let's see here. Outline the pathology events associated with ARDS. A quantitative decrease in surface increases alveolar surface tension forces a qualitative decrease in surfactant increases alveolar surface tension forces which causes alveoli to become unstable and collapse and leads to atelectasis so that means when you don't have uh, 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 when you don't have enough surfactant it increases the, the forces of surface tension which causes alveoli to become unstable and collapse leads to atelectasis so when it leads to atelectasis, it increases the work of breathing of the baby. The baby starts to breathe heavily. 
because the 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 alveoli is not open because there there's a there's a higher surface tension so it causes the alveoli to collapse okay because there is not enough surfactant surface tension forces okay increases silver okay it increases the surface tension forces which cause alveoli to become unstable and collapse and leads to atelectasis and end increased work of breathing at the same time the increased surface tension draws fluid from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli in combination the factors measure oxygen okay the cause of it is hypoxemia and ac acidosis so the the patient oxygen becomes low pulmonary vascular disease pvr as a pulmonary artery pressure increases right to left shunting and increase the hypoxemia worsens hypoxemia and acidosis also impair further surfactant production steroids given before the birth attenually have been shown to mature surfactant and fetus decrease the survival and improve outcomes okay now we're going to move into okay as pulmonary artery pressure increases extra pulmonary right to left shunting and increases because remember the left to right shunting is increasing because your alveoli there's no gas exchange because it's closed the alveoli so there's a surface there's no uh, because the surfactant and hypoxemia worsens that means no more oxygenation is going there because there's no gas exchange is happening at the lung hypoxemia and acidosis also impair further surfactant production Steroids given before birth attenuatedly been shown to mature surfactant function in the fetus, decrease the severity of RDS and improve outcomes. So there, there there's cases where they give uh, steroids before birth. Okay. Okay, let's keep going. Clinical manifestations. The first sign of respiratory distress in infants with RDS normally appears soon after birth. So this is important here. So this is going to talk about the signs. Signs. So we're going to put signs of RDS. So this is important. This is how you're going to know if your baby is, if the newborn has a, if the newborn has RDS. So we're going to see the signs now. This is when the, when you see the newborn and then you look at them, you observe them to see if you can see these signs. If you see the signs, you will know that this baby has RDS. Okay, the first sign of respiratory distress infants with RDS normally appears soon after birth. So the first sign you will see it after the baby is born. Tachypnea. Tachypnea occurs first. So, the first sign is... Tachypnea. This is the first sign. Tachypnea. The, this means... The baby is breathing fast. So, normal respiratory rate for a newborn, for an infant, is 40 to 60 breaths per minute. Okay? Normal respiratory rate. If the respiratory rate is higher than 60, just know that the patient is tachypneic. Means they have tachypnea. If it's more than 60. If the patient is breathing 75, 80, just know that the patient may heart. It is a chance that this this infant has RDS. So they say here, the first sign is tachypnea. So be aware, this is the first sign of RDS. It's tachypnea. We said normal is 40 to 60. It's not like adults. It's different. It's higher. So above 60, you're going to suspect that this infant has RDS. So this is the first sign you're going to see. Okay, first sign. After tachypnea, worsening, worsening retractions, paradoxal breathing and abdominal grunting are observed. So retractions is you're going to see. So second, we're going to see. After tachypnea, you're going to see retractions. So I'm going to put retractions here. 
retractions. Retractions. And I'm gonna show you what's retractions. I hope there's a picture here. There's no picture here. But inf infant retractions. I'm gonna Google it and I'm gonna show you a picture. Hopefully I can find a picture. Retractions. Yay, I found it. Okay, good. This here is retractions. You see where, where see here? Those are retractions. You can this is when they're breathing, you will see this here. Okay. Also I'll give you another one right here. Do you see the retractions? This is when they're breathing. Ba basically you're gonna see their ribs. So this is retractions, okay? And let me see retractions let's see this one also this one but you can't see it here it's not clear but this is what you will see but uh, of course the infant is going to be very small and uh you, sometimes you're going to be you, you will be able to tell uh very easy very easy to tell it's not going to be difficult okay it's going to be uh easy to tell Okay, so the second one is retractions. Okay, let's let's keep going. Retractions. Okay, retraction. Uh, paradoxal breathing. Paradoxal breathing. Let me see if there's a. Uh... Let's see if there's a photo here. Basically, basically the opposite. Paradoxal breathing is basically the opposite. That means when they inhale, their belly is supposed to go up, but instead it will go down or it will go sideways. So this is what paradoxal. So it's, it's the opposite of breathing. So you see this one here? This is a good picture here. Paradoxal breathing. So that means this is normal, but this is paradoxal. Their chest is going up and their stomach is going the opposite way. This is also a good picture of retractions. And let's see, get a little closer. And this is excellent picture of retractions right here. This is what you will see. You will see it in the sides here. And when you're looking straight forward, visible, okay. And that's paradoxal breathing, okay? And then we can add here, we can also add here paradoxal breathing. But this is also the result of retractions of, anyway, to Kipnia, this is what will lead into it because of the high work of breathing. <laughs> The patient is breathing faster and faster and above 60 and is going to lead to retractions, paradoxal breathing. and all that. Okay, so now those are the signs. And audible grunting are observed. Also, audible grunting are observed. And we're going to say audible grunting and you will hear it in an infant you will know if they have audible grunting this is when they breathe okay let me see if i can find audible grunting for you
We knew that this home use device was going to dramatically boost the love lives of men all over the world. Okay, now I got through the video. And this is Infant distress means your baby and apnea. Your baby's chest must a grunt to keep air this in the a, lungs. This is a grunt. This is... Grunting you may sound like snoring or singing. Kind of more like snoring, not singing, okay? Because they're saying it's like singing. It's not singing. It's kind of like the, 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 um, but you will know that, that how they're grunting. <clears throat> almost like a snore, almost, but it's not a snore, okay? So we already put that there too. So we put grunting, okay? Audible grunting. Oh, nasal flaring. I want you to really pay attention to this one. Nasal flaring also may be seen. So nasal flaring, it's easy to know. And most of the time I look at nasal flaring. Nasal. And it's so easy to, 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 uh, to see nasal flaring because they're, uh, let me see if somebody, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that most of the people know what's nasal flaring, but if, for the people who don't know, I will show it. Nasal flaring. Nasal flaring is right here. This is when their nose is like when your breathe goes up and down the flaring. Okay, of your nose. That's like when you run and then you, you, you're breathing faster. So you will see that nasal flare. Okay, so let's continue. Chest auscultation often reveals fine inspiratory crackles. So we're going to add that here. When you auscultate, when you use your stethoscope to listen, you will hear on inspiration, you will hear fine inspiratory crackles. Fine inspiratory crackles. This is what we'll, you, you will hear. Fine inspiratory crackles. Okay. Fine inspiratory crackles. Cyanosis may or may not be present. Cyanosis may be present or may not be present. So I'm just going to add cyanosis. And that's uh, blue lips on the blue lips or extremities that are blue. That's cyanosis. Okay. And there is two types of cyanosis. You have uh, peripheral cyanosis and central cyanosis. Central cyanosis is the most concerning one because that's going to tell us that the patient is not uh, oxygenating and uh, cyanosis is another topic I'm not gonna get into deal uh, detail into that and but I will uh, create a video on cyanosis on central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis and then uh, I will upload it if I get a chance uh, I'm also extremely busy so it's very difficult for me to follow up with these videos but I will try my best so uh, if central cyanosis is observed, so you see the second one, central cyanosis. They didn't say cyanosis because there's two types. You have the central cyanosis and you have the peripheral cyanosis. It's observed. It is likely that the infant has severe hypoxemia. And I just stated, I just said it in central cyanosis. It means severe hypoxemia. Certain, uh, certain, thing, certain uh, other conditions such as systemic hypotension, Hyperthermia and poor perfusion can mimic this aspect of RDS. Those are, can be le led to this. A definitive diagnosis of RDS usually is made with chest radiograph. Diffuse hazing rhetoric. Uh, okay, so to diagnose the definitive, definitive diagnosis of RDS is usually made with a chest x-ray so i'm gonna put a big note here okay. 
definitive. Okay, where, where did we go? Uh, okay, definitive. Diagnosis. of RDS is chest x-ray. So even though that you see these signs in this in the infant, even so, though you see those signs, tachypnea, tractious, paradoxal, all this, but still you're not gonna be diagnosing this infant that they have RDS based on those signs. To the definitive diagnosis where you say this is definitely this patient has RDS, you have to do a chest x-ray. And what will you see in this chest x-ray is, I'm gonna write it down here, and this is what will tell you, okay, this patient definitely have it, is you will see uh, diffuse hazing protect, uh, reclo granular densities with presence of air bronchograms with low lung volumes are typically of RDS. In, in uh, figure 34 to 32, and this is the x-ray, it's very hard radiograph appearance of severe respiratory distress syndrome, A and, and being lateral show diffuse hazing appearance with low lung volumes in air bronchograms that extend into the periphery. So that means their lungs is, is uh, let me see if I can, these x-rays are not great on this book, but you can look on Google and you will see uh, different types of, uh, of, of, of x-rays that will show you definitely that, that this patient, this, so that this patient has RDS. So if the doctor is not sure if the infant has RDS, they will, um, order an x-ray and the x-ray will come in and, and do the x-ray and then you can look at the x-ray with the doctor and you will be able to tell if the patient has RDS or not. So diffuse, this is what the x-ray will show, okay? This is what the x-ray will show if they have RDS. It's gonna show diffuse, haze, hazing is description but uh, then sites, Rectangular, reticular, granular densities with presence of air bronchograms with low lung volumes. with uh, air brown program with low lung volumes. Okay, let me see if I can find an x-ray on Google map images because the, uh, they normally have they normally have a really good uh, x-rays here This is an excellent, uh, I just saw one here. So I will show you the chest x-ray. So this is one of them here. So this is a normal lung. You will see, so the air in the lungs when you take an x-ray is black. So this is air, so this is a normal lung, infant lung, and this is an infant with uh, respiratory distress syndrome. 
So this is an infant with RDS. So you will see here that it's completely white and there's no lung volumes. Just here a little bit in here. So this patient is really is and really in distress. So this patient will be uh, his oxygen will be very low. So he will be hypoxemic. Okay. So this is what really gonna determine if the patient have uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And uh, I'm grateful that I found this image here for you to see, okay? And uh, I will show you a different image after they give them uh, surfactant because they administer surfactant for those newborns. And uh, this is an image of a patient. So this patient here who has before surfactant, you see how it's all white out. And uh, so this patient have uh, the, the um, RDS. So after, you see this is before surfactant and this is after surfactant. After they give the patient surfactant and this is how their lungs look. You see, it's, it's always black, it's all black. This is air, so gas exchange is happening. Patient is getting oxygen, okay? I hope you all learned from this because this is very important in your field and you will see it many times and this is important you always should look at the uh, x-rays because it gives you a definite um definite diagnosis of the patient okay even though you see the signs but this is definitely a patient here with rds and this is after they gave them a treatment of surfactant uh, and then this is what happened after this is an x-ray after surfactant Okay, I'm glad I was able to find those um, x-rays on Google Images to show you because this one here is not clear because it's uh, a black and white copy paper and that will be the reason why it wasn't clear here, okay? Okay, so now measure bronchospirine by the collapse or consolidated lung tissue so uh this bronchograms is air that appear as irradiated dark major bronchi surrounded by collapse or consolidated lung tissue we already know that there's no surfactant atelectasis happens and then uh that's what happens you cannot let's move on now this is where everybody's waiting for which is treatment how can we treat uh patients with uh, RDS. This is very important. So the first treatment as always is CPAP. CPAP and we have a bubble CPAP. That's what we've been using um, at our hospital. We've been using bubble CPAPs and it's the best. It really does help them a lot and they oxygenate good. And what it does is just remember CPAP is just a continuous positive airway pressure. It gives them that peep and it keeps their airway open. So it helps when the airway is open, when the alveoli is extended and it's open, gas exchange happens, oxygen goes to the lungs, goes to the body, and the patient is doing great, okay? So treatment, uh, CPAP, and uh, which is, you know, it gives you that PEEP, are the traditional support modes used to manage RDS, surfactant replacement, therapy, highly frequency ventilation, high isolation ventilation. If the patient is not doing well, let's say the patient is not improving, by using a CPAP or surfactant replacement, then next you will go to a high flow uh, ventilation. Have been added to these additional approaches. Unless the infant's condition is severe, trials of nasal CPAP is indicated four to six centimeters. And this is what we use a normal four to six. Most of the time we use a, a CPAP of five or six or seven if we have to. Because of the hazards of endotracheal tubes, ET tubes, nasal prongs are preferred. If the infant clinical condition deteriorates rapidly, a more aggressive approach is required endotracheal intubation. This is only we will intubate the patient, we will go to in, in, uh, intubation if the patient is not doing well. This is the last result, but first we will start with CPAP. After CPAP, we will give surfactant treatments and then we might go to high flow ventilation high flow but the, the last result is intubation should be performed okay as elective procedure mechanical ventilation with peep should be initiated if oxygenation does not improve with cpap so if there is no improvement from cpap so fact and administration and all that we have tried all 
and then we will go to invasive invasive which is endotracheal intubation we will intubate the infant and connect them to a, a ventilator that will be able to produce a higher peep and also it will also push and keep the alveoli open mechanical ventilation with peep should be initiated if oxygenation does not improve with CPAP or if the patient is apneic or acidotic. So if the patient is apneic and he goes into apnea, he keeps breathe, he stops breathing, and then we will go into mechanical ventilation. There is significant interest in approach comparison intubation, delivery of surfactant extubation in the nasal CPAP. However, more research is needed to understand the risk and benefits of this approach. The aim of mechanical ventilation for RDS is to prevent lung collapse and maintain alveolar inflation. Again, we already discussed that. So the main concern of, of, of to intubate them is to keep the alveoli open because we couldn't do it with the CPAP. So now we're going to move to this. In severe RDS collapse of alveolar with every breath necessary, very high uh, reinflation pressure. To prevent the need for the high inflation pressure use of in Tidal pressure is necessary because of the relationship between arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide and functional residual capacity. RPS is low with PEEP is used to uh, optimize off FRC. Again, it's important to read that. This chart here will tell you the drugs of surfactant. In the doses, surfactant dosing, dosing information, and this is based on the infant's weight, administration, dosing, and, and this is very important. This is the types of, of, of surfactants they have. Those are the names, and this is the doses and how much you should give and why not. Okay, so let's keep going. Time constant of the lungs in RDS is short. The time constant is short. So the lung empties very quickly with each ventilator cycle. So that means in each time cycle, the vent, because the lung is empty. Remember when I showed you that x-ray, there is no air in there. So RDS patients, when they are connected on a vent, their lung empty very quickly. If alveolar ventilation is inadequate, either peak inspiratory pressure or rate should be increased. So if they're emptying quickly, you're either going to increase the, the peak inspiratory pressure that, that the patient is getting or you increase the rate. So you're going to give them a higher rate so they can be filled more. You're going to increase their minute ventilation. For minimizing the possibility of volume trauma, because you don't want to give them volume trauma, the peak inspiratory pressure should be kept less than 30 centimeters of water. Very good. This is a very good. If you are doing mechanical ventilation, you should know this. You should know that a higher pressure than 30 centimeters of water will cause volume trauma. But I'm sure people who's um, watching this, some of them are not up to that level and not doing mechanical ventilation yet. But it's also good this is to understand. Okay. And even lower peak inspiratory pressure than get for in and it's good. For surfactant preparation are uh, currently available in the United States for managing neonatal RDS. Okay, so this is just mentioning the names of them, the ones that are in, in the names. Perpactant and alfactant are natural bovier surfactant. This is just giving us the, about the, the medication. I'm not going to read it. You can read this one. It's just going to tell you about the surfactant, the medication that was given, the name of it. And what is it about and how it works? Surfactant replacement therapy is also used as both rescue treatment in infants already have IRS and prophylactic therapy in care of infants delivered prematurely. So you can use it as an emergency or not. Some centers use prophylactic surfactant replacement therapy in the cases of all very small infants less than 15 kilogram therapies aimed to decrease pulmonary edema, improve cardiac output, weaning from oxygen, and all the above. So, rule of thumb, this is very important. FRC is best supported by positive by CPAP or PEEP. 
because you 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 increase their functional residual capacity and this is the functional residual capacity that makes them alive what keeps them up all surfactants are delivered by et tube so how do they deliver the surfactant they administer it by the et tube they pour it into the et tube of the patient and that's how they deliver the surfactant. Animal studies suggest that surfactant is rapidly distributed through the lung. Each surface surfactant, what I've seen in hospitals, how they deliver it, they squeeze surfactant into the into the um, ET tube and they keep the patient on one side to go into the left lung and then they switch him to go to the right lung. And they, you know, the baby is so small you can turn the him or her from side to side. Answer description about positive okay, infant surfactant. Basically, the infant positioned okay section. Okay, you see this. Basically, the infant is positioned with different sections of lung dependence so that the surfactant enters the section of the lung with gravity flow. So, what they mean here is you, the patient, the infant, you turn him by gravity, you squeeze the surfactant into the ET tube, and it goes from one side to the other side. If the infant is very sick and cannot be repositioned, surfactant can be administered with the infant in the supine position. So even though if the patient is not is very sick and you you don't want to harm them by turning them from one side to, to the other, it's fine. You can just squeeze the surfactant right into the ET tube. Okay, now we have a problem, meaning clinical problem, and we can read it. Okay. Respiratory distress syndrome. Problem. A woman is about to deliver a 26 week of gestational age. Remember? I told you. 26 week. What should the RT have available for res resuscitation of the infant? Discussion. An infant at 26 week of gestational age is most likely going to have RDS. Ranging from mild to severe disease. The RT should have equipment, supplies, and drugs necessary to support the infant. Many infants require mask bag ventilation. It is crucial that the RT be actually attenuated to using the lowest pressures necessary to move the chest. It is very easy to injure the lung with high tidal volumes. It is most authorities recommend the use of a T piece resuscitator that develops manual breaths if fixed pressure, decreasing the risk of, of traumatic injury from the high tidal volume. So in this clinical procedure, they're giving you that this baby will be preterm, right? 26 weeks. So you know that this baby will most likely have RDS. So this problem is giving you what will you have ready as a respiratory therapist. Of course, you're going to have your AMBO bag. Or what they use in the hospitals is called uh, what is that called? Wow, I just had a long day now. I forgot. I forgot. What is it called? What we use? You will see it. Uh, neo Neopuff. There we go. There is a Neopuff which is used as a um, what we use to ambo the patient. And uh, I will make another video for the Neopuff and how to ambo the patient, the infant. But that's basically what will you have and all the equipment when you're in the hospital it will be there and let's see what it says here some infants you will also if i was here i will also have a cpap ready as well a bubble cpap because patient might not need resuscitation the patient might not need the bag valve mask ventilation the patient might need the cpap some infants have severe disease that requires intubation and immediate administration of surfactant some infants have my only mild disease. These, these less sick infants may require only nasal CPAP for infants. I just said it. I might get CPAP for infants who have uh, intermediate disease. At some centers, clinics intubate the infants, administer surfactant, and then extubate the infant back to nasal CPAP. So that is true. I've seen it so many times in our hospital, in my hospital, that I've uh, at 26 weeks come out. And uh, first, we use the Neopuff to, bag, to, to, to ventilate them if it's needed. And then uh, they get intubated. Then we administer surfactant. And after surfactant, when we wean them, we take them off the vent. And then we uh, give them a CPAP. And they do fine after a few weeks. And they're done. Everything is finished. And they're breathing well. And they're getting better. So here is the main idea here is to be careful with high tidal volumes because you don't want to uh, give the patient value trauma. 
because value trauma will cause so many other problems okay thank you so much for watching i hope some of you learned from this lesson i've covered a lot in this chapter and all i covered is rds and it's a very long interesting topic and you will see it in your practice it is uh yeah and thank you so much for watching please forgive me if i've made any mistakes comment below if you want to point out something that i made a mistake and you want me to correct and i will forgive me if i made a mistake in this video also make sure you subscribe like and leave a comment and share it please share it with other students that they can help you can help this is very important stuff that i'm teaching here it's neonatal and pediatric neonatal is a very interesting topic and it's also a very stressful environment to work in if you make it and you need a lot of information to know thank you so much for watching I appreciate every one of you that is a respiratory therapist or trying to become a respiratory therapist out there. Thank you so much for all your services that you do. And have a good day. Thank you.